We're doing to, what I'm talking about here is formalizing the early health care that we talked about last week. So if you remember the picture on the left, is that rather sort of um, rural idyll with possibly or possibly not Hippocrates sitting here doing his writing outside. It was all a bit rural, it was all a bit grassroots, that kind of medicine, which we'll, I'll just remind you about in a minute. But it didn't take very long for the picture on your right to become a picture of medicine being learned. Now, that might not be <laughs> look exactly like we're doing here, obviously. It looks probably more like a church to you. But that's actually where university lectures started. And believe it or not, this is not a, uh, a minister or a priest or whatever. It's actually the lecturer. And there's his lecture there in the book. And here's the students all sitting down here. I'm not quite sure what this bloke's wandering around for, but anyway. Um, this is a university lecture. So that's how it, what we're going to talk about today. How did we get from this picture to this picture? And then a little bit further on, which leads into how you're here today. Okay, so there we are. The two approaches in medicine, how did we get to them? We get to the reading, not maybe books so much these days, more stuff online on your laptops or whatever. But there's also the practical side of it, particularly if it's medicine. So you're doing stuff with your eyes and your brain. You're also doing stuff manually with, you, with your hands. How did medicine become like that as well? So those are two aspects we're going to be looking at today. Very brief recap about Hippocratic medicine. I'll usually try and do a little recap so you remember from the previous week. Remember we said Hippocratic medicine, the stuff that was outside, they wandered around to the marketplaces, was very popular. Popular because of the oath which really gives us the basis of ethical medicine today. It was theoretical, which was also popular, although we don't necessarily agree with the four humors, the fluids in the body. Nevertheless, it sounded impressive because it was theoretical. But it was also practical, remember? The humors in the body, the fluids in the body, had to be balanced. And how did you balance them? Well, they had to be in balance with the larger environment as it were so the microcosm which is a human being has to be in balance with the macrocosm which is the environment make it as big as you like how do you do that in Hippocratic theory well you have prescribed diets you prescribe maybe very simple drugs fairly straightforward ones these are rebalancing strategies and some of, in fact, most of it was mainly preventative. This was really preventative medicine. Remember, they picked up the idea of the daughters of Asclepius, so Hygieia was the preventative one. You kept yourself clean, you kept yourself energetic, you ate well. But there was also curative if you needed it. Panacea, the quick fix, the simples, the drugs. But Hippocratic medicine didn't depend on that quite so much. Why was it popular? Well, remember... The Hippocratic healers came to you. You didn't need to go to them. So they'd come around your marketplace, they'd have a chat to you, they'd ask you what was the matter with you, and they'd tell you, remember, what was going to happen to you. Particularly popular because it was based on human endeavor, what humans did. The gods weren't interfering, which is always, well, it can have the good side and the bad side, but... Nevertheless, this was, we can do it ourselves. It's, it's human endeavor. And also the basis of what you told the patients was diagnosis, exactly what we would expect today, what's the matter with you, but also prognosis, what's going to happen. And that led to quite a lot of patient satisfaction. They were, in fact, they were told, remember, if you do as we say, if you follow our instructions, you'll get better. If you don't, well, you only had yourself to blame, as it were. And there was also an early psychological approach. So here's almost the beginning of psychology, uh, psychiatry in a way, because these humors also affected the moods of the body. So if you were out of balance, you could be very cross or you could be very lazy. Um, so it was, it, was an, it was an overarching sort of approach, which was extremely useful. All right, you might think, well, I'm talking it up. If it was that good, why didn't it hang around forever? Well, as you can see, bits of it did, obviously, but a lot of it didn't. So why did some of it not? What happened? 
I'm sorry, I haven't got this on the, on the PowerPoint. This is the trouble of having to send the PowerPoints off early. Um, but it's really, what's going to happen is referred to in the history of science as a paradigm change. Something isn't working so well. You need to think, what's going to work better to keep people healthy? This seems to have reached the end of its usefulness. This happens all the time in, in medicine, as we'll see as we go on. And I'll put paradigm uh, change up on the uh, future overhead. So what happened? Well, apparently Hippocrates, if he was even a real person, died. Or the people who were creating this sort of image, they all died off, they got older. As sadly people do when they get older, it was a bit less innovative than it had been. Um, the theory and practice went into the doldrums. It just wasn't really getting anywhere. But at the same time, an unfortunate thing happened. The Hippocratic writings, which had been, as you can tell, written down, became almost like holy writ. In other words, at the same time as they were becoming a bit old-fashioned and out of date and no more innovation, the practitioners were claiming that you couldn't possibly go against them. Now think about today, that's a very bad thing for any theory or practice to have to cope with. It all has to move on, it has to change. Otherwise we'd be still back goodness knows when. So without any change, things do stagnate and that's exactly what happened with the Hippocratic writings. Um, this is a picture, a rather glamorous, glamorized picture of possibly um, a Hippocratic practitioner but what it does point to is that a lot of these Hippocratic practitioners didn't even hang around in early ancient Greece. They took themselves off to somewhere where things were a lot more cutting edge and a lot more interesting. Where was that? We'll see in a minute. So, we're going to talk about, um, again, the Mediterranean. Sorry, this map's got cut off. I don't know. It's really annoying. It came up on my screen all right. Um, okay. We're going to talk about over here, um, Italy, <laughs> which is conveniently just off the map here. Sorry about that. Um, and we're going to, but we're also going to talk about this co this coast here, which is of course the, in those days in the uh, the, co the western coast of Asia. We're going to talk about this bloke briefly. He really is important. History as being the history of, I know dead white males is not popular these days, but just occasionally, some of them were actually quite useful. And he is so influential that you can't miss him. You really can't. His name comes up even nowadays. So here he is. You can see a kind of Roman version of his name, Claudius Galenus. You can see his dates here. We're into the common era. And the sea before it just means about. We're not quite sure when he was born. So around about 130 to 201 common era. So we're into that now. Now what about him? Well, he was born in Pergamum, which is on, on that coast there. Um, still there today. Um, he was middle class. I mean, that's not a term they used in those days, but it's what we would say these days. His parents were educated, um, and they wanted him to be educated as well, which indeed he was. Um, he claimed himself, and you can see how good his claims were, to be a philosopher, a physician, and a writer of many works. While he was certainly a writer of many works, he seemed to be a fairly good physician. Not too sure about the philosopher, although, as we'll see, philosophy, as remember with the Hippocratics, philosophy went together with healing and medicine, because you thought about it. You didn't just do it, at least if you were a sophisticated practitioner. So, this is Galen. He was generally referred to as Galen, not Claudius Galenus. And, perhaps more importantly than anything, and of course, again, it's cunningly cut off the map, isn't it? You're going to have to imagine this. Um, he was trained in Alexandria, which is, any of you possibly know, is in the north of Africa. So on the Mediterranean, kind of down here, as it were. That's important because the name Mediterranean, of course, means middle of the world, as you probably know. And this was in the middle of the then known ancient world. So Galenus's, Galen's life is really centered around Pergamum, where he came from, 
Alexandria, where he studied, and then Rome, where he went to, which was the hub, the place to be. Very, very important going to Alexandria. It was like, I suppose, being maybe a Rhodes Scholar today or getting a place in exactly the university you wanted to go to where they're doing all the cutting-edge stuff. And I'm sorry about cutting-edge because it's actually literal. That was, I wasn't meaning to say that, really. Um, they were actually cutting, yes. Um, <laughs> This is, I mean, this is the picture I showed you last week, which is possibly not what you're thinking it is. It's not like somebody torturing somebody else. Um, this body here, you'll be happy to hear, is actually dead. Um, we're not really sure whether this was... Uh, this probably wasn't a picture from Alexandria, highly unlikely. But it was very hard to find the correct kind of picture. I just wanted to give you the idea of what was going on here. Alexandria was the place ambitious young possibly physicians wanted to go to. Why? Because you didn't just get the Hippocratic training, you got hands-on training. Um, also, was there training in medicine as well? In what, sorry? Which he what, sorry? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm just not hearing what you're saying. Say it again. Um, yes, tell me about that. Um, so it's a branch of medicine which relies on like, the afterlife. Oh, yeah, oh. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But look, there, there's so much here that I'm not, t I have to say, that I'm not telling you about. This is a bit tunnel visioned, it really is. I can't tell you about everything, obviously. I mean, even when the Hippocratics were around, there were so many other different sects yeah. who were all fighting each other and all hated each other. I don't want you to give them, I mean, that's good you said that, because I certainly don't want to give you the impression it was all just one lot. It really wasn't. I'm only focusing on this lot and what they did. Because they're kind of like the road in to what actually became kind of standardized sort of Western medicine, if you must call it that. Later on, we'll talk about some of the complementary and um, uh, associated stuff and how did it get to be called that? Why did you have one lot that looked like the main road and all the other lots? How did they win, as it were? So it's a good point. It's a timely point. By no means was this all they did. And there's 10 million other sects round about them who are all saying, I'm better than you, as we'll see in a minute. Um, but their selling point in Alexandria was that they actually cut up bodies. And they didn't just cut up bodies for the sake of cutting them up, obviously. They cut them up to see what was inside. Now, plainly, this wasn't an alive body. It was a dead body. So all you were getting was really the internal structure you weren't getting the internal functioning. That was going to come later using animals. So it wasn't perfect. But they were at least getting a hands-on chance. And even then it wasn't. Because these bodies, were, as we'll see in a later lecture, were quite hard to come by. People weren't very keen on having their bodies cut up, even after they were dead. They were a bit worried about the afterlife and things like that. So generally what happened is the kind of chief people would do the cutting up and the students who were there, whoever they were, would, would watch. So it wasn't really hands-on. But you were seeing somebody actually doing something as opposed to just reading your scroll and seeing what was on it. And there weren't even very many pictures on scrolls in these days, as we'll see in a moment or two. It tended to be all words. So, Alexandria, great for Galen. He could put that on his CV, trained there. And that's going to get him a job. Very, very famous ever since then. As you can see, there's been statues of him. There's a statue. There's a medieval version of him. So he was still being illustrated later on. Uh, very, very, a Greek stamp. He's so famous, he even gets his face. Oh, of course, that's probably not at all what he looked like. Nobody really knows what he looked like. But nevertheless, the name is famous. And he was also transformed into one of the three fathers of medicine. No mothers yet, as you'll notice, but we'll bring some of them in later on. Hippocrates, who we've heard about. Galen, who we're hearing about now. And Avicenna, who was a, um, a much more Eastern figure. He did research, and we'll hear about this in a later lecture, into things like smallpox and measles and things like that. So these are the medieval period, as you can see, this is that time, thought Galen was right up there. 
He was absolutely one of the figureheads of medicine. And um, there's a sign in this picture that these three are, in fact, physicians. I mean, you wouldn't necessarily know, would you, because they're reading books and they've got all this stuff on and there's no medical sort of paraphernalia around them. What is it? Do you know what it is in that picture that tells you these are physicians? There's a clue there, like a puzzle picture. Any thoughts? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> but on the other hand, other professions, I mean, lawyers and other people read books as well. There's something there that specifically tells you these were physicians. Yeah? Sorry? You might think so, but actually what the clothing tells you is that they were educated men, the long robe. Um, if I'd been lecturing in those days, well, I would have been a different sex for a start. But I would also have the long robe and the hat to say I was a professor. Any ideas? No, will I tell you? Yep. Yeah, the jar. The jar, this one. But, but, let me tell you and don't think this is too awful. It didn't actually have medicine in it. Anybody want to hazard a guess what it actually had in it? Fluid, plainly, yes. <laughs> what kind of fluid? Hmm? Yep. Nope. Urine. It was a urine flask. Why would, why would somebody be staring meaningfully at a urine flask? Sorry, sorry can you just, I can't hear him. You would think, yes, yes. In fact, that's exactly what it is. But, of course, they didn't say that. They, here's an interesting mixture of practicality and a bit of mysticism, despite the fact they said this wasn't mystic. You looked at the urine flask. Of course, you could tell if the urine was cloudy, if it had blood in it, whatever. People do that for diabetes these days. But that wasn't really the point. It was more... If you read any of Galen's work, you'll see he does this. He's almost like Sherlock Holmes. He comes in and he looks at the urine of one of the patients and says, oh, I see immediately this person is suffering from such and such. Of course, he sent his spies out beforehand to discover what they were actually suffering from. So it's almost like a kind of trick. Um, there's a very, very old hackneyed story, which may or may not be true, about a professor standing in my place maybe about 100 years ago, and of course all male students, and he held up the flask and said, this is a urine flask, um, here's what the old doctors used to do. And he held up a finger, and he put a finger in the flask, and he licked it. And he said, that's what they did. Now, unfortunately for the poor, I'm not going to do it, <laughs> the unfortunate people sitting in the front row he came over with the urine flask and he said, now I want you to copy exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. Serve them right for sitting in the front row. So what did the two in the front row did do? They held up the finger, they put their finger in the urine flask and they licked it. And he said, gentlemen, because they were all gentlemen, here is your first lesson in being a physician, not licking urine, <laughs> plainly, but observation. Did you not notice that I put one finger in the urine but licked the other one? <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Good story. Um, it might be um, because observation was plainly important. And that, in fact, was how Galen made much of his reputation. He actually observed the patients. Were they flushed? Were they pale? This was quite new, and he was very popular. Okay, moving on. What Galen did was to take a bit of an adapted Hippocratic approach to Rome. Rome was the center. Roman Empire just coming into its own. Very powerful. Tentacles out throughout the known world. The empire stretched very, very wide. But it wasn't completely the original Hippocratic approach. It was a 
a changed one, because remember, the old one had got a bit tired. Uh, Galen was so popular and so successful that he became physician to the emperor. A bit of a double-edged sword, that one, because you wanted to be very successful if you were physician to the emperor, because, of course, if the emperor unfortunately got sick and died, you would be the one held responsible, which would not be something you would want. Fortunately, Galen was extremely sure of himself um, and seemed to have no qualms about this. But he also, and this is where the title of the lecture comes in, as part of his job as physician to the emperor, he treated the gladiators in the Colosseum. Here you can see the ruined Colosseum. They had these Colosseums, round structures, in every city in the Roman Empire because it was um, entertainment for the populace. So what happened in the Colosseums? Um, they had gladiators, that was men, who were trained to fight, either each other or animals, or animals fought animals. Um, we used to think that the gladiators were not treated very well. And to be fair... Um, they could come to a rather unfortunate end. Um, let me just show you in a minute. Um, Galen actually got practical experience with these gladiators being injured, so they were injured, plainly. But there was a bit more to it than that. Here's some of the gladiators on an old fresco. You can see them there. And this is obviously a painting from much later on. Here's the gladiator with his foot on his opponent and the populace up here with their thumbs down. That means kill him. Don't let him go. We don't really know whether that actually happened. In fact, a more nuanced reading of this area seems to say that these gladiators were actually specially trained. They were often slaves because this was a good way out of slavery if you were successful and you could actually make quite a lot of money. So they were trained. You don't want people you spent a lot of time and money training just to be killed. Just So we think a lot of these things, a bit like some boxing matches in the past, were probably staged to give the population a good uh, show. Likewise with the animals, although a bit harder to control them, obviously. But the point about this is Galen got incredible experience, hands-on experience, treating the gladiators. There's no doubt about it, some of them had horrible wounds, particularly if something had gone wrong. But remember, they're valuable. So there's a big incentive to patch them up and get them back on their feet again. So Galen's experience with hands-on the gladiators was extremely useful. What was his approach then? Well, he wrote numerous texts. When many, many hundreds of years later, a lot of this was found again after they'd been lost for quite a while, 22 of his writings remained. There had actually been hundreds of them. Not, of course, written in books, written on scrolls. We'll see how they were saved in a minute or two. But that's the point. This is what anybody down through the ages who's left a legacy in medicine, surgery, this is how they do it. Well, they do two things. They write about it, and they also have pupils. If you don't do one of the two you could be doing the most wonderful work in the world and nobody will know about it. Exactly the same today. It needs to be carried on. And people need to read about what you've done. Nowadays, of course, it gets put online and things. Um, then they were writing on scrolls, later on books, as we'll see. So he was actually a bit ahead of his time, was Galen, in publicizing. A complete self-publicist. Um, he said, and again, he was kind of kidding his listeners a bit here, Prognosis, which was popular, remember, was not divination or prophecy. No, he said it's based on, re they didn't use the word scientific, but if they had, he would have done, real scientific um, observation of the patient. It's not just some kind of ho hocus-pocus magic, although, as we'll see, he did do a bit of that as well. Um, he synthesized and systematized current medical knowledge. That's great. That's now, even nowadays, that's a good way to get published. If you give current medical knowledge to students, for example, whoever your students are, in some kind of packaged way, uh, it'll get read. And that's what Galen realized. So that's exactly what he did. 
But he also, <laughs> unfortunately, we still get this today, um, he also wrote scathing attacks on other physicians, and as our friend up the back here pointed out, there were many, many other sects in this period who all hated each other. A lot of them had come to Rome. They all had different approaches. You can read about them in some of the readings. And they were all incredibly rude about each other. They just said things, oh, that lot are useless. Don't go near them. Come to us. Plainly, they would say that. Um, so he's very, very scathing. But look what he claimed, which was actually not completely true. He claimed to be returning to the true Hippocratic approach. And again, we'll see that time and time again. You can even spot it nowadays. No, no, I'm not really talking about some new and revolutionary thing. Really, this is just the same as we're doing now. I've just made a little improvement on it. And that's the way you get people to go along with you. If it's too revolutionary, it can be a bit worrying. So again, Galen kind of pioneered this method of getting his audience and his patients, plainly, to come along with him. It's an unthreatening way of suggesting a change in theory and practice. You know, oh, it's just the Hippocratic way. It's just, he just made a few changes. It's fine, it's fine. Um, very clever, very clever. Okay, so what are we talking? Galen's treatise. Um, he wrote, of course he wrote, and the theme of what he wrote, and one of the writings he did was entitled, That the Best Physician is Also a Philosopher. That was, quite frankly, Galen big-noting himself. See, I'm not just somebody who works with his hands and fiddles around in bodies, I think. We'll see this is going to be a big problem right down the ages. People who think and people who do. The ideal thing is to do both in medicine as we'll see. Because from now on until about the 18th century, science is referred to as natural philosophy. Not science, you don't hear science. It's natural philosophy. And that equals critical thought. You don't just take things without thinking about them. And it's critical thinking. So that's, of course, how it leads into modern science today, which we like to think of as thought plus experimentation, the two aspects of it. First thought, then experimentation, or sometimes the other way around, but it's certainly both of them. So we actually have Galen to thank for, for this kind of approach, and here's a picture which may or may not have been him um, in the early days with some of his treatises on, on the stand there. Okay, moving on quickly then. Uh, were there problems? Yes, there were. Many, many problems, which can partly be seen by this rather weird diagram here. Don't worry if you can't see it too well. Um, just let me explain quickly. Galen could look at the inside of a gladiator because quite often their wounds were so large that you could actually see the heart beating within a living gladiator. But that didn't happen very often. And in fact, you can, obviously, you couldn't get a very good look. So how are you going to see how a body functions, not just its structure? Well, the obvious way was with animals. So Galen used many, many animals. Um, there was no problem those days about ethics with animals. There were no committees or anything that told you you couldn't use animals. Um, you could use any animals you like, basically. So Ga Galen has a very helpful little um, part of one of his writings where he tells students and fellow practitioners what are the best animals to use to study physiology. Um, apes are good, plainly, because they're similar to humans. Pigs are strangely very good because their internal structure rather strangely actually does resemble humans. Um, if you can't get an ape or a pig, well, dogs and cats will do because they roam the streets. There's always dogs and cats available, so that's what you do. Was there trouble with that? Yes, there was. The trouble was that Galen said, well, here's what it's like inside an animal. It's much the same inside a human. Plainly not very different. And this led to considerable confusion later on. Imagine if you're a surgeon trying to actually work on a human body and you think its interior is similar to that of a pig or an ape, which it plainly isn't completely. 
So to cover this problem, Galen came up with what we call a teleological approach. In other words, here's a diagram of, he didn't draw a diagram, nobody drew diagrams in those days. But this is somebody later on who's compiled a diagram that's basically saying what Galen said about human physiology. He's, you can see, it's very strange, he's got a huge liver here. Um, he's got a weird looking heart up here. Um, he's got, we haven't got time to go into it now, but he's got completely wrong blood vessels and things. So it's certainly not what we would think of as being the way the human body actually um, is, consists of. But he rationalized. That's what this teleological approach was. He said, human organs work in the way they are intended to work. <laughs> Which, of course, is a complete cop-out because he's not really saying how they work at all. Um, because he doesn't know, basically. Part of the reason he was taken up was the early church, the early Christian church, was very keen on this approach because it sounded a little bit like God has made the human organs to work as they should work. And basically, we don't need to question them. That's not really what he said, but that's what it came over sounding as if he said. So he's got a huge bit of vagueness here. And finally, he had a problem with plagues. Uh, infectious disease, as we would call it. Not so much around as there was later on, because as we all know, infectious disease tends to start in areas of high population and spread quickly. Not so many cities or even large towns in those days, but nevertheless there were some. There was a big plague in Rome in 166 in the Common Era, not quite sure what that was. It's hard to do what they call retrospective diagnosis. But whatever it was, it killed a lot of people. Well, how did you account for a plague if you believed that everybody was body, literally body, was unique, and you had to treat everybody individually? How, do you get, how would you get everybody being sick at the same time of the same things? It didn't make sense. So Galen came up with this idea, which was popular until the 19th century, of miasmas. Either the state of the air around about you, or some, he didn't really say something in the air, but he did say it could be little particles, perhaps. You can see what that's the beginning of. But that's all he said. And remember that Rome in those days was built on marshes, marshy air, almost like some humidity we've had recently. You can almost see like a kind of fog in the air. Aha, people said. And it's got a funny smell. Miasmas. Look, everybody's getting sick at once. We would say malaria, of course. But it was a good way of rationalizing. So he added that to the Hippocratic corpus, this idea. And it lasted until the 19th century. The huge outbreaks of typhoid and cholera in London in the 19th century were attributed to miasmas, not to um, microbes or bacteria, because nobody knew about them by then. Okay, moving on quickly then. After Galen, what happened? Obviously he died. Um, not so good. Bit of history, very brief bit. The Roman Empire, of course, as we know, fell around about the 5th century CE. Everything became, um, we think, maybe less civilized, although they used to call this period the Dark Ages. We're not quite sure if it was as dark, really, as, as we used to think. Nevertheless, it would appear that a lot of art, culture, religion, healing certainly didn't progress, um, even if it didn't actually disappear altogether. But what did happen was that the medicine of the Hippocratics and Galen mainly, and again, that's why we're talking about them, because it wasn't the medicine of all these other sects that we were talking about. This medicine goes into the monasteries, the religious houses, because the religious houses managed to survive the Dark Ages. Even the tribes coming and taking over the Roman Empire were a bit apprehensive about um, being too drastic with, um, with religious houses. So here's what happened. The monks in the religious houses kept the works of Galen and others, the scrolls. Um, they didn't just keep them, and this is important for later, they copied them. Scribes. Here's a scribe. 
Not everybody can write or read in those days, but scribes can, the monks. So they copied the works of Galen, so that there were multiple copies. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been. And also in these monasteries, there were infirmaries. That's where we get the word from today. For the sick brothers, the medicine there was Hippocratic and Galenic. So it carried on that tradition of medicine in two ways. Practically, again, that's the medicine that the, the sick brothers got. And it was copied by writing into a collection of books. And we'll see in the next lecture when we get there how that problem led to considerable misunderstandings. Because if you copy something, you don't always copy it accurately, as we'll see. Alongside all of that, round about 800 CE, was a man called Charlemagne, that just means Charles the Great, in Europe. He was a bit of a megalomaniac. He took over the ruling of most of Europe. And in order to aggrandize himself, make him look splendid and wonderful, he founded a whole lot of the cathedrals that you can see in Europe still today. Massive buildings. We wonder how on earth they did them in those days. All to the glory of him. Not so much the glory of God, really. Although in theory, that was what it was supposed to be. And what did you get along with the cathedrals? You got schools. That was where the clergy, um, this lot here with the mitres on, you can see here, they're all, this was the, um, the coronation of Charlemagne, or at least a version of it. He was crowned in a cathedral. This is all very grand and impressive. So these cathedral schools for the clergy are set up, not in a separate building, but simply in an aisle of the church, where they can be taught to read and write, they can be taught, taught from the Bible or various other religious books. This is the start of what we now think of as universities self-regulating community of students and scholars. Gradually, gradually, lots of these large cathedrals had these schools attached. So, oh, sorry. Uh, from the 11th century, these univ and here's another picture of the same sort of thing. Notice who's there. They're all male because, of course, they're going to be the ones who are going to be the priests. But they're not just going to be priests, because these schools became bigger than simply training priests. They started what we would now call faculties. In other words, oh well, there were other universities, there were also quite a few of them, Bologna, Paris, and Oxford in Europe, Bologna in Italy, Paris in France, Oxford in, in the UK. They were some of the first... Um, universities who weren't which wasn't just a cathedral and they also started faculties so you could have the faculty of arts you could have the faculty of law the faculty of theology and medicine one of the first ones to actually um, have a special kind of training and who were the students well the students as I've said were all male you couldn't, in, it, in case we think, well, okay, that was a bit um, anti-women, wasn't it? Um, there were reasons for that, which we'll go into later. Um, but it wasn't just any male, anyway. You had to be already educated. So you had to be proficient in classical languages, Greek and uh, Roman, uh, yes. Um, any other Eastern, sometimes classical languages as well. And that's part of the reason why it tended not to be women. Because although some women certainly were well-educated in this period, particularly women coming from well-off families, they were often educated with their brothers, a lot of women weren't. So in fact, they weren't even eligible to go to these schools. But the blokes were, and they started when they were about 13 or 14. So it was actually a bit more like a boys' boarding school, really, than a university. But nevertheless, this was extremely good training for them, and it was institutional training. So look what's happening. It's gone, medicine has, and healthcare has gone from out in the marketplace, grassroots, um, simple herbal medicines, this kind of thing, to actually institutional training in a building, being lectured by the bloke up there. So next week, 
We'll talk about artists who illustrated some of the books that were going to be used in these new universities. Here's the famous illustration of the skeleton. We'll talk about anatomists, the hands-on issue, that you don't just learn with your brain, you learn with your hands. And we'll learn how books were produced that students could learn from. Okay, we'll see you all next week.